Hey everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, the content executive at Higher Things. And joining me again today is Paige. How are you doing, Paige? Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, I love having you here because we get to sort of get into the nuance of, of tough things. And we're trying to figure out sort of that, that worldviews colliding. Where do we find ourselves as Christians interacting with people who don't believe the way that we do? We're calling this mind the gap. Um, and uh, we're, we're keeping it nice and, and simple. Um, Paige, we're going to talk about the problem that every major religion has. In fact, every minor religion has. There's this, this big question of why does it hurt? <laughs> Right. Um, there, there's better ways of saying it, though. Right. Uh, because this is maybe actually one of the things to address. What was the thing that you were uh, that, that you were wondering about today? Um, the problem of evil, because I've heard a lot of stuff like in school, out of school, just talking to people on a regular basis. If there's a good God, why does he allow evil? I mean, it's kind of a fair question, right? Because like, if there is such a thing as a God and he is all powerful, well, then he can have it any way that he wants. And so if there's something going on, it must be the thing that he wants, right? Right. Right. And so then he tells you he loves you and lets evil things happen. And give me some, <laughs> give me some bad ways to answer this question before we start to get to the good ones. Um. The worst, I yeah. think the worst that I've ever heard was like, oh, that's just because that's how it is. That's how it is. That's how God designed it. And I'm like, but God is a good, loving and gracious God. Why would he design like evil into his plan? Like, what right. is that purpose? Time out. Let's just say hypothetically, you're asked a question you don't know the answer to. It's a really good thing to just say, I don't know, but maybe we can learn yeah. it together instead of that's just the way it is deal with it um that's I, I don't want to throw rocks at whoever it is that said that but i want to throw rocks a little bit because that's um that's that's not helpful um that that's just the way it is doesn't actually necessarily address the fact that god wrote a book to answer that question um and so he wants you to read it and know more about it not just say that's just the way it is uh like 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 you're a beetle or something um <laughs> Yeah, I think what they were trying to get at was the difference between hidden and revealed knowledge about God's plan for good and evil for the purpose of like us and to show that he loves us and how that all happens. And I think it was a well-meant statement, but not very well executed. I, I, that's, that's, I'm fair. And, and good intentions are, well, they, they make a lot of great paths somewhere um but this is this is still sort of that whole and another way to, to address it is to to run to the law sort of say um and, and this is where most religions actually go like not just christianity but like well if something bad happened to you clearly the gods are angry so what you need to do is find a way to make them not angry and then bad things will stop happening to you um but we we got to kind of address I think maybe even something simpler. It was the very first sort of thing that you sort of wondered out loud. What is evil? Paige, how do we define this thing? I mean, you can kind of define it as the absence of good is okay. a common definition or like a manifestation of something that's like wicked, especially in people's actions. So it, it would definitely be something more incarnate rather than abstract and I know that's something that um, is a little bit of a problem when we talk about evil because people want to see evil as this abstract thing like oh the devil made me do it or I can't help myself because it's sin so how how do we go about like when people are like oh the devil made me do it the devil is evil I'm not evil type thing like because I know that's a big question when it comes to the problem of evil, because people are so quick to say, it's not my fault, it's this thing's fault, or it's not my fault, it's this thing's fault. Right. So for us, I, I mean, like, one of the things that we almost have to do is back up a step and say, all right, so there's a fault. 
Let's talk about that. Um, th this thing that happened before we ever get to whose fault it is, let's see what it is. Um, and, and this is actually an important thing because um, we can say evil is the absence of good, but then we have to say, well, what is good? Um, and so we, we still get with this really abstract concept of, of evil um, because we also have an abstract concept of good. For Christians, it's a little bit easier. Like we actually define evil as uh, very clearly laid out inside of the Ten Commandments. These are the things that break God's creation. They are the things of, of death. Um, we, we actually have an, an, a definition of what is good. Uh, it, it's the things of God. Um, his, his law, his gospel, these are, are good. Um, and so if God is nearby, it is good. And if God is far away, that is evil. And so evil then is the things that then um, that aren't just sort of floating around in an ether that I don't like, but they're rather the things that God says break his creation. Um, and, and then we can start to get to fault. Um, because like the, the things that, that sort of broke creation altogether um, happened maybe not the way that we, we always sort of like to put it on. Uh, because, well, at least the scriptures, they don't call it um, the devil's fall. They call it man's fall. They call it Adam's sin. Not even Eve's sin, by the way. Adam's sin. Um, it, it, it gets tied to a person. And, and that's an important thing to remember. Because if evil is just sort of an abstract concept, like you said, well, then it's it's presence here, it, it gets doubly challenging. It, it's almost sort of like playing who farted um, in, in such a way. I know there's something here that I don't like, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, whereas if you actually can, you know, get really scientific and play whoever smelt it, dealt it, now we can start to get to the problem of, of the problem. Um, I am clearly a mature adult. Uh, so it, instead of like just bickering about where this these things came from, we're actually given an, an objective way to address what is evil? And then we go to the Ten Commandments. We talked about this last time, the objective evil, or the objective truth, excuse me. And so now I can look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, whether or not the devil tempted me, it still happened, right? Yeah. So if this is a, a thing that's here, then evil becomes, well, like you said, it's it's incarnate. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying it's it's, it's of a person. It's, it's in made flesh. And that's every bit as important to understand uh, as our religion, because we talk about Jesus being incarnate. And that's a really, really important thing for us. Paige, why does it matter so much that God became man? Because it, from my understanding and from what all I've learned, this might be a Bible, like Sunday school answer, but God became man because we are man and sin is of the flesh. So in order to beat sin, death and the devil you have to beat it with it so you have to beat the flesh with the flesh type um idea i guess that makes if a that lot of sense, sense. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the right sunday school answer jesus became man to, to die for sinners because the problem of, of sin exists in our flesh and so god can't just sort of will it away but he, he actually deals with the fact that sin really does break stuff it's not just sort of an abstract concept like here's negative 10 jesus points if you think this thing negative 20 if you do that thing um a, a, instead rather sin is wrecking God's creation. And so he heaps all of that unto himself and the person of the son, he bears the cross for you. He dies for the sinners and the sinned against. He takes all of the evil and the suffering in the world and he puts it on himself. And he, he says, it's, it should be punished here. And that's an important thing because now not only do we have a, a place for evil, but we have a place for God in the middle of evil. Um, it, it's, it's a, a, a very, very different thing because the critiques are right. If there is a loving God who doesn't want us to hurt, why do we hurt? Um, and, and if there is a, a loving God who could get rid of evil, why hasn't he? Um, and it sounds really, really powerful to just sort of say, well, clearly there's no such thing as God because I don't like the things that are happening. You can't say it that way. It doesn't sound as powerful, but you can say something along the lines of, well, look at all the suffering in the world. Look, there's, there's starvation, there's, uh, there's death, there's cancer, there's, there's war, there's all sorts of awful things in the world. And if God really were in control, he would stop it. I know it because I would stop it. And that, that doesn't seem like rocket science. Um, but you have to take a step back and say, all right, so where's all of this evil actually rooted? Um, and it's, it's, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but if it's in us, then God getting rid of evil would be God getting rid of us. Of us, Yeah. Is that love? <laughs> I don't think so. It doesn't seem, it seems just, but it doesn't seem like a just love. It just seems like a just punishment. 
Yeah. And, and we need both I, I, because that's the other side of it. Like if, if God is only loving and never just, well, that means then that the people breaking things should just keep doing it. Like it, it doesn't matter because it's just it be the thing that you are no matter what. Um, if, if it is um, a, a question of, of just justice, well, then you sin, you go to hell, very simple. But for there to be love and justice, there actually has to be then a place for evil and a place for God. We, we sort of teased it. It's, it's, it's the cross. Um, honestly, if you want to understand it, what you have to do is, is you have to go upstairs in my house to my living room, which is, is it's a disaster right now, Paige. Um, there, there's toys all over the place. There's books all over the place. You step on a Lego. It's a painful place to be. And it's because I have kids. I have little kids. And so as much as we clean our house, we turn around for 30 seconds and the house is messy again. And it would be really, really easy to have a clean house. Just get rid of your kids. It's not love though. Yeah. love is not getting rid of your kids to have a clean house with nobody in it love is at the end of this i'm going to go upstairs i'm going to sit down in the mass and i'm going to read a book to my kids in the middle of a cluttered litter living room because i would rather be with them in the mass than apart from them without it when there is a mess when there is evil we can fight over blame all we want but sort of the problem with fighting over blame is that jesus says it's his fault he takes all of the sins of the world, he puts it on his own shoulders, and he says, it's my fault, punish me. And then he, he, he goes to the cross. When there's evil in the world, I know where to find God. He's not far away from it, judging it. He's on the cross, bearing the judgment. There's evil in the world because, well, God would rather keep the world with you in it, messy, painful even, than go a second without you, than see you condemned for it. it and that's it, such it, a comfort, it's such a comforting thing, too. To know that God loves us so much that he would rather have us in our messy than expect perfection. Keep going with that. It's, 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 it's really important. Okay. Well, that's um, basically all that thought was, but um, think about like, it. like, honestly, think about it. So, so my life is, is a mess and like, honestly, that's not okay. But if just saying that's not okay is enough, I still can't fix it. Yeah. It's like, okay. cause I feel like we as humans put so much pressure on ourselves like oh if I'm a god-fearing person I must do this I must do this I must be perfect for god like but that's not what god expects he ex he is almost like he expects us to be messy because we're human that's okay. kind of our mo that's what we do like we're messy people and to expect perfection out of us on behalf of god is kind of backwards because we should have that assurance that we already have that um, perfection because of God, despite of our evil that we do. Right. And that's, that's the Christian answer. But it, it's funny, if you think about it, that Christians and, and atheists together um, would expect to find God only where there's like sunshine and rainbows and still waters and green grass. Like we go to the 23rd Psalm and we can't expect to find God where he promises to be, but, but only where we would imagine him. So like I can say, though, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou are on the other side of it, waiting where things are better. And if I can only get myself to there, then I can be with you. Um, where's the comfort for that in the middle of a school shooting? Where's the comfort for that in the middle of, of, of sickness and sorrow and death? Yeah, that just makes it this unattainable, like, only if I get this far, then I can be in the presence of God. Yeah, type so thing. the world then becomes ours to fix and not God's to dwell in. And so not only have we disembodied evil, because we don't want the blame for it, but we've disembodied Christ, who actually wants to take flesh to save us. There's, there's no help there. Um, so instead, we look to the cross where God is made incarnate to address an incarnate evil, mine, yours. Um, and, and we can talk about this uh, with anybody uh, in this way. Um, it, it actually gets easier to talk about when you can put God in the flesh and put evil in the flesh, because otherwise it's just concepts. Um, so it, it, it gets um, only one more place a little bit tricky. And that's that, um, why do we always have the, the sort of the temptation to sort of merge pain and evil into the same thing? Yeah, I'm not sure because I've heard like, there's this example that I've always heard of like, okay, if a parent allows pain for good for the child, like for example, if a child has been told to wear their knee pads when they go out rollerblading, I know I was told as a child by my mom, if you don't wear your knee pads, you're gonna skin your knee. And you go, you're like, I can do this by myself. I don't need to listen to my parents. And you go and you skin your knee. 
and um, it doesn't mean that just because like your parent allowed you to feel pain, it doesn't mean that they don't love you. And that's like something that I've heard in relation to evil too. It's like, just because you have experienced something evil doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Like, and so I can kind of see where those two, like how they kind of look like they could go together, but why don't they? Well, I I mean, I guess I would start with just the simple scriptures where like, I know God doesn't want there to be murder because he gives us a commandment that says thou shalt not murder. Um, So I I know that's not his will. Um, His will is not that there be murder so that I know that he loves me that because that's a hard thing to say. Um, And then you can kind of carry it forward and and start to recognize um, that that not only is there a a God who says thou shalt not murder and wants to reveal himself through the scriptures, uh, but, but rather there's a God who puts himself in the middle of murder. So uh, again, instead of sort of recognizing that that pain is, it's true, uh, pain is a law that is preached very loud that anybody can hear. Um, sin breaks stuff, pain hurts. Um, but also you have to deal with the God who calls suffering a blessing. And so if I call anything I don't like evil, really then um, exercise is evil, vegetables are evil. They, these are, yeah, you see all these things that are just abstractly evil because I don't like them. Um, but that's a very subjective, again, reality. And we, we talked about this again last week. Um, that, that might not be the best place because what's evil for me might not be what's evil for you. If it hurts you and it's fine for me, well, then it's clearly all right. So that also makes things like adultery, not sin anymore. You see the problem with this, right? Because if, if it doesn't bother oh, yeah. me, it bothers you, well, it's only pain for one of us. And one is just not evil at all. And the other is just God wanting to make you aware that he exists. That's, that's a bad approach. We, yeah. um, rather, I want to start with Jesus because Christian, um, it was not evil that Jesus bore the cross, that he bore the pains, that he bore the sufferings. In fact, it was good. Um, suffering, he talks about as a blessing, not because he wants you to hurt, but because the place where you are saved is a cross. And when you were saying, Lord, keep me as close to the cross as possible, you, you recognize that sometimes crosses hurt, sin breaks stuff. Um, it's, it's not good that there's hurt but God can use hurt for good things. And so we'll we'll sort of go back then to the God who says, thou shalt not murder. Um, He also does something with this. It's not that he wants there to be murder. It's that if there's going to be murder because they're sinners, he wants to use it for good. And this is, this is a nuance. It's a, it's a, but let's, I mean, I would invite you to recognize that maybe God can handle a little bit more nuance than a tweet Um, and, and sort of say, all right, so if there is a God who, could actually control everything and for some reason wants to save you, even though you keep doing bad things, painful things to other people around you, he's going to have to work within that creation to keep the wheels turning. Otherwise the, it it would have fallen apart a long time ago. Like think about how many ways we've almost destroyed all of creation already. Um, I I mean, I genuinely mean that like we could wreck the earth. We have built the weapons that we could wreck God's creation with. Um, He has every once in a while actually worked good out of evil it's not that it was good that it happened but that he took this evil thing and worked it for good it's a power that god has that nobody else can do i can take evil and make more evil i can even take good and sort of keep it good but god can take something abstractly uh, objectively excuse me evil and actually bring good out of it so if i told you that there was a place where somebody would be um slandered uh beaten mocked abused and then murdered could he bring the salvation of all the world from that? Well, yep, Jesus did. So now I can say it wasn't a good thing that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. It wasn't a good thing that uh, the government uh, worked evil. It wasn't a good thing that the crowds called out against him. It wasn't a good thing that he was murdered. But God worked good out of it for you. And so now I say there's evil in the world, but there's a good and present God bearing the evil himself, carrying us through it, and, and actually wanting to, to find uh, himself carrying us here in, in concrete, again, incarnate ways. So I, I know where to look for, for God, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup runneth over. There's an altar set up in the valley of the shadow of death. There's a, a, a cup on the altar filled with something overflowing, a chalice, filled with the blood of Christ, surrounded by sin, death, and the devil, feeding sinners and nurturing them and carrying them through. 
This is where there's going to be peace because if it's just, there's a bad thing. So there can't be a God. And then you have to deal with the fact that from the fall, God still wanted to be with us, redeem us and carry us. Yeah. Like, and something you said, you said the, um, if there's a bad thing, then there can't be a God. So if you inverse that, if there's good, then there should be a God. Ooh, keep going. So like, there's this paradox that everyone wants answers. Like if there's justice, then there must be something that's unjust. If there's good, there must be something that's bad. So if we say the absence of God is, or the absence of good, sorry, is evil, then what is good? And like you said, then with that logic, then if, you know, all of that's true, then God must be good and there must be a God because there's good. Right. And this is something that I, I think almost would be tough for somebody outside of the church to swallow because, well, they would just say, well, it's good because I did it. <laughs> um, but you know what that's, you know what that's called, right? That's idolatry. <laughs> um, yeah. like it's, that's, that's saying I am God. I am the worker of good. Evil is not in me. It's an abstract thing out there, but I am good. Um, and, and so let's just maybe back up and say, all right, so um, not just nobody's perfect, but do you think you are the most powerful thing out there, the smartest thing out there, the, the place that, that good must enter in from? And if there is, how do you deal with the duality of man? How do you deal with the desires to, to hurt and destroy? How do you deal with the fact that, well, if, if there is good being worked among humanity, there's also a lot of evil. Um, if it's just sort of a complex thing, again, what you have are two abstract concepts warring with each other. But I want something concrete, and so does God. He, he makes these things of the flesh. He created you, and even after we fell into to sin and, and we, we became, um, our, our flesh was corrupted by evil. You can find evil in a flesh. You can also find God in the flesh working good. Um, we, we, we need this thing to be there. And so if there is good, you're right. There, there must be something working it. Cause I know it's not me. Um, like I honestly, I, I should be dead by now. I've done enough stupid things. Um, so it, it, instead of that, um, we, we want to start then with the, with the problem of evil, uh, with the solution of good. Um, I know where God is when evil things happen. He bears it himself. God is not the God who wants to be far away from evil because he's not the God who wants to be far away from you. That, that's where we're going to go with this. Yeah, that's definitely, like, I don't know very many other people besides Christians who can claim that their God loves them so much that he's literally sent his son to bear all of the evil of the world, suffer, die, and then he rose again because he loves us so much. So there's your good in answer to your evil. God, like, he already won like, even though we still have this problem, we can rest assured that the problem's already taken care of. It's not our problem to fix. Right. And, and so we're, we're going to fall on the cross. We're, we're going to run back to hope. It, it's not that we justify the evil. It's that Jesus justifies us. It, it, it's not that we ignore the evil. It, it's that we, we let it stay in Golgotha where it belongs. Um, that's, that's how we deal with evil. We, we, we have a Jesus who dies on the cross for, for us, not just it, but us. Uh, Paige, thanks so much. That, that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was super helpful for me. I hope it was helpful for you as well.